Welcome to FinTech Confidential, bringing you the people, tech, and companies that change how you pay and get paid. Welcome to Accrued, the FinTech Confidential series presented by LoanPro. In this series, we're deconstructing the complexities of lending and exploring compliance, optimization, modernization, and personalization through the insightful conversations with the industry's best. I'm Ted Huff here with my co-host Colton Pond. We'll be guiding you through this intricate lending world, whether you're deep into Lintech or just intrigued by how technology is reshaping lending, you're in the right place. Now let's dive into another episode of Accrued. Cold Thanks, man, Ted. It's good back. to see you again. The hair always looks great. The necklaces are great. So I, I'm excited for, uh, <laughs> we were actually having a conversation before this, the three of us around how we could do a whole podcast uh, episode on your hair. So eventually we'll need more insights there. Oh, uh, Scott and I want to know, but uh, for now, excited to dive in with Scott today. Definitely. Well, you know, I try to bring the good vibes. So we'll, we'll start with that one. And today, talking about good vibes, today we have a company that is known for many decades as leaders in innovation, and it's none other than Galileo. It's a financial technology platform owned and operated independently by SoFi Technologies. They're a driving force in fintech landscape, and Galileo is one of the few marketplace platforms that not only combines banking and processing, but it powers some of the fintech elite like Chime and Monzo with their most dynamic solutions. Their robust platform enables fintech companies to launch, scale, and enhance their offerings efficiently. From payments and card issuing, lending, to their cyber bank platform and risk solutions help manage this intricate payment system landscape. Now, it's impressive that Galileo's technology not only underpins all of these seamless transactions, but it's for over 151 million accounts that rely on them every single day. Now, the biggest differentiator with Galileo, in my opinion, is their people. And today we have joining us today, and Colton kind of snuck it in a little bit here earlier, we have Scott Johnson, the Senior Vice President of Business Development at Galileo, and he has a rich background in product management and strategic innovation. Scott's been a key player in steering Galileo through its remarkable growth in the fintech area, and his leadership has guided Galileo through its expansion into new technological frontiers, offering scalable and secure financial solutions that empower banks, fintech startups, and enterprises all around the globe. Today, he's here to share with us his unique perspective on evolution of financial technologies and how Galileo is enabling the future of digital finance. Scott, it is a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, Ted, Colton, I really appreciate that intro. I'm super excited to be here today. Excited to talk a little bit more about some of the things I'm very passionate about, about fintech and banking and payments. So again, thanks for having me on. Here's a quick message from the Accrued Series sponsor. As default rates continue to rise and margins compress in lending, financial organizations are searching for solutions to combine that operational efficiency with innovation. Look no further as LoanPro allows lenders to enhance their origination, servicing, collections, and payments using the foundation of a modern lending core. Check out LoanPro.io to learn more about how over 600 financial organizations have modernized their tech stack with LoanPro. Now, I'm going to switch gears just here real quick. Colton, you and the folks at Loan Pro have been working really closely with Galileo. Can you give us a perspective on Scott? And don't forget how Loan Pro yeah, and Galileo absolutely. are working well, together. I have a unique perspective because we have the blessing of having some rock stars who previously worked at Galileo and now work at Loan Pro. So I hear from them about this legend and myth, Scott Johnson, and who he is and the impact that he's had over 20 years at Galileo and like uh, people like Susan Chafin, who uh, is very blunt and very honest with every opinion that she shares. So I know that if she says positive things about Scott, it's incredible. Um, Scott, what I would love to know is you've been at Galileo 20 years now, uh, give or take. Or what employee number were you at Galileo? It's been just about, it'll be 20 years next month. And I'm thinking, and I'm right around that. I'm like 20 or 21 or 22. And we've got close to about 2,200 now. So it's amazing to see how oh, much wow. it's grown over the last, uh, yeah, over the last quickly. I'm, I'm going to go off the cuff a little bit as I like to do is head knows, but 
Uh, tell us one of your favorite early day stories at Galileo. Uh, 20 years is a long time growing the company and eventually being acquired by SoFi. Okay, I'm going to tell you a great story. And this is early, early days um, back in 2004 when I started for Galileo. It'll take just a second. We had just certified to be a MasterCard endpoint. And MasterCard had come out and we had a tiny little office. We had at that point, four server racks is all, is what we were running our system with, okay? And MasterCard went on a tour of the building and I was the first guy taking them on the tour. And I walked by our data center and you're not gonna believe this. The company above had had a flood in their fridge and we had water coming down oh. into our data center as I'm taking MasterCard on the tour. I open the door and I see that and I turn around, I'm like, hey, you know what? Let's save the best for last. Why don't we go and I'm going to take you on a tour of the rest of the building, introduce you to some people. I walked by a few folks. And I said, you're not going to believe this. There's water coming in the data center. Go upstairs and get it fixed. So they ran upstairs as fast as well, got it fixed upstairs, grabbed some towels and paper towels. They're cleaning water up. We walk around and then all of a sudden I kind of get the signal like this. I take them back. I'm like, hey, let's go do this. So I was tap dancing the whole time, showing them, hey, look at the beautiful view of the mountains, all that good stuff. So just kind of the crazy things that you go through um, in the early stages of a company, but just a lot of fun in some of those early days. It was really just the wild, wild west of payment and some of the things that were going on, but amazing to see kind of some of the foundations that were built at that point and how much that's kind of we've used to grow it's into the future. fun with how scrappy you need to get at the beginning. I, I love that aspect. And it's also cool to look back and be like, man, we've come a long way. Like we've achieved a lot. So today, especially I'm stoked to get dig into your 20 years at Galileo and yeah. and your insights on fintech financial services ecosystem the future what that looks like and the impact of like where we're headed and insight that folks in financial services can draw from your expertise so Ted let's kick it off uh, well Scott I, I want I want us to kind of maybe move forward past the uh, the reigning server room but still reflect ba back on on the last couple of decades and and the financial fintech landscape and how it has changed for you to share your perspective on the role that Galileo has played in this evolution of fintech. It's really interesting to see how much things have changed and how much things have grown, you know, in the last 20 years and kind of some of the key themes that I think where Galileo has really fit in the ecosystem. You know, we like to think of ourselves as the AWS of fintech, right? We like to think of us as kind of at the center of, of so much of the activity that's going on in, in FinTech and, and the types of companies that we work with. And really is, is I go back and kind of reflect on it, kind of how we got to this, this place. I think kind of one of the major things that, it, that, is, that has been such a change for everyone, as we know, are these, are these great devices. Mm -hmm. And what happened with us, just like anyone is, is, you know, we get smartphones and mobile technology. Well, where we really kind of made this strategic decision was, you know, 13, 14 years ago, we decided to publish our APIs. And that was the probably kind of one of those key turning points is I go back and look. And I mean, now it's like, oh, well, published APIs is no big deal. 12, 13, 14 years ago, that was pretty novel stuff. And what was so fascinating is I go back and kind of look at the journey of where we've been is once we made that decision to do that, all of a sudden we had all sorts of different use cases and constructs and companies coming to us that we really hadn't even dreamed about that were like, oh, well, can I get your APIs to do this? We're like, that, that'll that work. And then this and that. And all of a sudden, <laughs> what was so fun is to see like all of these different types of companies and now looking at against a lot of the world-class, you know, fintechs that we work with that run on our platform. And that's why we kind of look at this and, and, and kind of uh, see where we played in this space is really enabling these companies, you know, like, like one, you know, one of our partners, Chime. It's amazing to see when they came to us, they didn't have any customers. And now they've, you know, disclosed they've got tens of millions of customers and do an incredible amount of volume. And so it's been really, really fun to just kind of help them through that journey as we've grown and they've grown and seeing now, you know, again, some of these, these incredible names that we work with in the marketplace. 13 years ago, Scott, y'all were probably one of the first companies to publicly uh, post your API documentation. That wasn't a thing. And now, as you mentioned, every tech company that has an API first solution or even dreams about having an API first solution has some level of API docs publicly available on readme or, or other resources, which is awesome. Yeah, it's really interesting, Colton, because, you know, again, I, I know it sounds like so natural and normal now, 
that was a huge kind of risk and a kind of a big leap of faith because it was like, well, you know, we're basically standing out for the whole industry now. Like, here's exactly how we do it. Here's everything. This is, you know, everything that we've built from these APIs. But it was amazing. It, it was at the time kind of a big leap of faith, but it was a key strategic decision that we made that I think really enabled a lot of the growth that we had across the business was that decision to do that. And then just continuing to yep. enhance and add to those APIs and just keep that documentation. That's one of our core competencies we feel as having just the easiest user experience possible within that documentation. Listen, I'm a marketing and sales guy. I think even I might be able to kind of plug in some of that code, given how easy it is. <laughs> if I can do it, then pretty much 100%. anybody can do it. So along those lines, Scott, what I like to do often, especially with folks that have been fintech, you've been you're probably one of the longest people in what we consider fintech today. What are some of the challenges that you faced in the early days of Galileo? And what are some of those challenges you face today? And how are they different? And how has the industry evolved over the past 20 years? It's interesting. So I go back and look at it. I can't believe, like you said, that I've been at this, the same company for 20 years. I will say this. I can't believe how fast it goes when you're doing what you enjoy doing. And so that's one of those things that it's like, I hear it and people are like, wow. 20 years with one company. And I'm like, yeah, but it's amazing when you enjoy what you're doing, how fast this goes. But it's interesting as I go back and kind of look at some of the challenges and always then think about what that means for the future. Listen, it was no fun in 2008 during the financial crisis. I mean, there were days when we were like, okay, which companies that, that, and banks that we're working with are going to be around? Those were some scary days. And we've had times knowing that in that time frame that we look at and I go back and I'm like, wow. That was a little bit a little bit scary. But I, I then go go look at that now and I kind of think about what does that mean for the future? Even right now, I mean, there's some challenges in the marketplace. I mean, interest rates. I mean, Colton and Ted, we know with Loan Pro, I mean, what you know, being in the in the in the lending credit, you know, servicing space, so to speak, a higher interest rate environment can be challenging. And so it's interesting to go back and look at some of the playbook that we did back then and some of those challenges that we've seen. And kind of some of the ways that, that I think helps with the roadmap as we look to the future. I think one of the things that we really focused on during some of those challenges is we tried to make a bet on companies that we really felt had a great product offering. We felt we're going to be long-term partners. So listen, I'll be honest, back in 2008, we had to we had to delay some invoicing and some billing. Like it got pretty scary for a while. We were like, oh boy. But we looked at the companies that we really wanted to, to bet on and we said, listen, we're going to be a good partner. We're going to stand with them through some of those challenges. And it would it made all the difference, you know, as far as us continuing to grow. And I think that's one of the things you can look at. Some of the challenges are potential future headwinds in the marketplace to say, listen, let's look at this. Let's take a long-term perspective on our customers. Let's not just like look at that short-term perspective. Let's take that long-term approach. And I think it's really kind of the way we think about our business now as well. Now let's quickly shine a spotlight on a game changer in the financial world, ClearingWorks. Simplify your financial management with a one-stop solution for all your AR needs and with a single login. Are you intrigued? Visit clearingworks.com to schedule your demo today. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think a lot of fintech companies today are forced, unfortunately, to take a short-term perspective because they're venture funded and they're burning capital. What I love about what you said is like, hey, true growth, a company like Galileo that has had true growth and a successful asset and is continuing to grow today, aligns with how to help support your customers and partners and not take strategic bets on everyone in the industry, but understanding their business model and understanding the ones that actually have a line of sight to impact and differentiation and product market fit. Colton, you're, you're spot on. One thing that, that I think you touch on this exactly the way that we think about it. So being there as a partner and kind of where the where we can lend our experience with our program management partners that are trying to grow their business. You know, we've been fortunate to work with some of the, the leading fintech companies in the world. Um, and being able to take some of the experience, now again, not disclosing anything that you can't through an NDA. So let's be really clear, we're not like <laughs> from one and like put it over here, but really looking at some of the best practices that we found with some of these companies, because yes, I think you're exactly right. And so often some of these are looking at, well, what's my uh, cash burn rate? What am I doing as far as my revenue? Critically important. We really think of ourselves as like FinTech consultants is really helping companies through this journey to say, yes, we under we can help you. Maybe you shouldn't do this. Maybe you should try this. Some of the things that, that we look at again, so you can truly say, 
this is an idea that's adding value and not just in the short term, but really is something that, you know, kind of the mid to long term value. And we've seen that time and time again with companies in our space, like great companies, like another one, like company like Greenlight, they kind of pioneered this parent teen space. When I met with them, they had five or six employees. Like we drew out the tech, technology on a shaky whiteboard in their offices in the Georgia <laughs> Tech, and tech campus in, in Atlanta. And, you know, they'd barely raised over a million dollars. And now you look at them and they're one of the leading kind of fintechs here in the United States as far as, you know, offering that type of construct. And that's, I think, just a great story of how we were able to kind of work with that company and take them along this journey. As I, as I hear you talk about all of these different approaches being very consultative and at play the marketplace today, it, it seems like there's a there's a sea of sameness going on. And but at the same time, there are there are differentiators within those spaces. When when you look at at Galileo and and how you're coming to market, we've got you've got the banking functionality, you've got the card issuing side of the house. You've got the lending piece of it. You've got the risk tools, which are second to none in the industry. How are you guys delivering to the market a message yeah. and the tools to really differentiate yourselves from all of the extremely niche areas in each one of those specific areas? Because there's not really from my perspective, one company that directly competes across the board with you guys, it's, it's a bunch of individual companies. So I would love to understand the differentiation that you guys are are communicating of, of the benefit of having that all under one roof. Yeah, you're, you're spot on, Ted. It, you know, it, it's been very interesting to look at, again, Galileo's journey. And then as you think about SoFi, our parent company, acquisition of Technosis, which is now part of, part of Galileo with their modern banking core. And that was a very key decision that was made to do just kind of, Ted, as, as you were talking about, it's very interesting to see fintech is, for right or for wrong, I think kind of littered with very niche types of players and companies. And we decided and took a kind of a, a different approach, and I think that we're seeing it play out in the marketplace, where a lot of these lines are starting to blur or kind of blend together. And it's why we decided to say, listen, let's look not only from a payment perspective, Listen, I can talk all day long on why Galileo, Galileo's payment processing is the best company around. You can tell I'm passionate about it. I've been there for 20 years, love, love the company. But also then kind of looking at, as we think about the other side of this, now let's talk about the FIs. Because again, banking and payments don't happen without great financial institutions and the technology that needs to power that. And so one of the things that we, we did is we made, again, the strategic bet to, to really focus on a modern banking core technology. That is one of the areas where I think it, it, what's a little bit almost scary is, it, is I'll tell you another story here quickly. I love, I love telling these stories, right? Love, we, love the we, stories. We, we were at, I was at a conference a couple of years ago. I will not name the conference, nor will I name the bank that I was talking to. They were talking about how few programmers they really have that still can write Cobalt code. Now, Cobalt oh was, gosh. you know, from the 50s, 60s, 70s. 70s. Now, listen, I love the 60s and 70s. Heck, I was born in the 70s. I love the music from the 70s. I just don't want an 8-track player. That's where a lot of this technology was built, was in that era. And they said, we only have about five or six employees still at our company that know how to write Cobalt Cold, and they're all in their late 60s or 70s. That's a little scary. So that was kind of just one example that's kind of core to this thesis of why we think fintech and, and banking are going to kind of blend together and why we're so focused on um, using our modern banking core, our Gen 3 core, to try and enable banks to, you know, really modernize their core infrastructure. And it was kind of key to this kind of our thesis that a lot of these worlds are just going to blend together and we needed to have that core modernization on the bank. Yeah. Side. So I couldn't agree more. When you think about fintech innovation over the past 20 years, a lot of it has been appendages to uh, legacy core infrastructure, <laughs> PFM, Banking aggregation, online banking, mobile banking. They're all just like bolting on to this legacy technology. But in the end, I believe we're at a time to where the next wave of innovation that we haven't even thought about as possible is ushered in as you modernize that tech stack. So uh, trivia point, people, I, I always bring this up and I'm curious. I want both of you to answer actually. I'm um, going off the cup here uh, <laughs> because people are often shocked. So Pfizer of DNA really popular core out there within banks and credit unions. What year do you think 
Pfizer went to market with DNA. Oh. I, I honestly think it might be like late 70s. I might be totally off on that. I'm going to go 78. Like some of those have been around for a long, long time. I don't know, Ted, what's your guess? Oh, see, I was even going to go further back. Like in, I was even, I was going to go a Holy decade cow. before you. Like 68 is this. Y'all, y'all are further back than most people. Most people actually say like 2011, 2010, 2005. Yeah, but 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 cold. Wait, it's like Scott and I so, have been around this for what two decades, two and a yeah, half some plus fun decades. Fact, so so. Pfizer DNA is actually 1992, uh, but other popular cores okay. FIS IBS is 1980, Pfizer Premier 1976, and then Pfizer Signature 1983. That runs like uh, I don't know the numbers, but somewhere back. probably closer to 40, 45 percent of financial institutions on core infrastructure, to your point, Scott, are relying on this legacy technology or legacy infrastructure that has challenges innately within it. Well, I I think I heard the clash playing in the background somewhere right now. I've got, you know, like all these great, great music in that era. But, but, you know, it's interesting, Colton, really quick. Again, I think Rhett is is spot on in the way that you think about this, this kind of bolt-on approach. Here's PFM. Here's maybe a buy now, pay later, like these little bolt-ons. But at the end of the day, um, and, and the way that we think about kind of modern banking cores, we're not suggesting that someone does like a full rip and replace, as we like to say. That, that's like taking out like every organ in the body and throwing it to the side and put something new in. Like, we're not suggesting that. But we, what we do suggest is to say, listen, as you look at all these different bolt-ons, well, why don't you start by using what we could like to think of as a sidecar? Start with running this on the side in a modern banking core. So now we're not saying like you're driving 100 miles down the road and trying to change the tires. That doesn't work. But let's try and, and, and start thinking about it that way so we can start, you know, you know adding features and functionalities, then st- slowly coming in and changing the quirks. But at the end of the day, you know, you look at those pictures where it's like the house or like the garage is like on the roof and then you got this. And then at the end of the day, you're like, we just need to bulldoze this thing. Like this is not what it was built to do. That's really why we think we can solve this problem by saying, here's this modern making core on the side. You don't have to do it all at once. We can slowly start doing it, and then you can migrate and use that as the core infrastructure that you can then use to have a modern tech stack. The idea of of moving to the modern core has really gained a lot of traction just in the last, I'm, I'm going to say probably 24, 36 months, where where we've seen a lot of failures, um, failure to deliver or failure to launch, probably a better way to describe it with some of these legacy platforms and the pace at which the modern cores, like what Loan Pro is is coming out, has come out with, with the, the loan side of it, what Galileo is doing with, with the acquisition from SoFi and like all of these types of things that are happening are really accelerating it. And you're seeing it in every aspect of financial and the financial technology spaces. So I think we're getting ready to head into a, a new era of what is truly possible. And what we used to see as limitations are now going to be our opportunities to deliver on something brand new to people that never thought that they could get access to these types of services. Ted, one one thing, that's a couple of things to think about that I think you're spot on. I'll, I'll share one stat that I, I found is fa- fascinating. I read an article earlier this week that McKinsey put out about, about adoption in Latin and South America of, of banking you know, technology products. In 2019, the stat is they said they estimated between 30 to 50% of people in, in, in Latin America had access to, to some type of bank account. Post-COVID, they had it as high as 73%. Mm-hmm. And I think of that stat and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I look at this and I think that one of the things that's driving so much of this, I think getting back to why banks need to modernize these core systems is because I think of how fintechs have made it so easy to get these type of products. Yeah. When my 16 year old's like, dad, I need to get a bank account. I kind of was talking to him about options. I'm like, well, you can walk into a branch. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. what? Like, like walk in? Like, what do you, like, it, it just blew his mind. He's like, can I just do this on my phone? And I think that that's why, you know, so many of these fintechs have driven some of these changes. And I think that's why banks are now saying, listen, if I'm going to compete in the future, I need to modernize my technology stack. I need to do these things because I know that I don't have that core infrastructure to really offer the types of products and services 
and customize those products and services in the timeframes that I need to do it. And that's why I think we're seeing again this kind of move to for banks again to your other point, kind of last 24 to 36 months, starting to get a lot more momentum with banks looking to modernize their technology sets. It's interesting you bring up Latin America. There's a lot of new things that have come out of Latin America. And I shouldn't say come out of, but really they've embraced, right? So Brazil, the, after finding that they've seen so much of unbanked becoming banked, now the delivery of PICS, their real-time payments infrastructure, has just exploded. And then you've got, you know, other Central and, and Mexico, North America, but even Mexico has seen a huge influx of, of banking participants because now they have access to to better ways for loans. They have better ways to actually transfer the money. They have better ways to spend the money. And now you're they're starting to see a, a transition from the the cash receipt over to more electronic methods to really move that forward, which changes how we both in the US and elsewhere in the globe really look at how Latin America is moving forward. And I mentioned this on another episode, but the use of cards to to transfer money cross border, especially in a GPR, general purpose reloadable card, has just exploded from from all around the globe to use that as a method to move the, the money around. And I look at, I think the the blessing of the card brands to leverage OCT transactions has really accelerated that. And that, that offers a completely different perspective. And I know I just got way off on a tangent. I love the but, tangent though, Ted, because we're a big believer. What if you could build fast, but not break privacy? What if you could ensure data privacy governance and compliance with just a few API calls? What if you could worry less about PCI requirements while actually improving privacy and security? How much more time would your team have to truly innovate? How much faster could you build and ship new features? How much more powerful could your app be? Skyflow is a zero trust data privacy vault delivered as an API. Skyflow's radically simple design lets you collect, secure, and tokenize personal information like card data and payment details. And with built-in features like encrypted data and analysis and sharing, anonymization, and advanced governance, your days of choosing between data security and data usability are over. Whether you're just concerned with PCI compliance or need to go further to include CCPA, GDPR, SOC 2, and beyond, Skyflow has you covered. What if you could build fast but not break privacy? With Skyflow, you can. Visit skyflowsecure.com today to learn how. That's one of the key areas for us, again, as we kind of look at this evolution and where we think the future is going. We doubled down on, on Latin and South America um, really about four or five years ago. We've got offices in Mexico City. We support a lot of the, you know, kind of leading fintechs in, in, in Mexico, Colombia, and other parts of the continent. We really are bullish on everything you just said, Ted, because I am a big believer on remittance products, you know, the OCT transactions and MasterCard, you know, type two transactions, all sorts of things, you know, to be able to move fun in, funds in real time, it just drastically changes the way that, again, you go back and like we've talked about, 10, 15 years ago, you weren't able to do real-time transfers on your mobile device to a loved one in, into a different country. And that's one of the reasons why for us, again, just seeing this, again, what we like to call the electronification of payments. How many cash transactions were done in 2018, 2019 in some of those countries in comparison now to the number of card or electronic transactions. I mean, it's just hyper growth. And I think you're just gonna continue to see that as we go into the future. And it's one of the main reasons why, again, the other part, like uh, the company that, that that was acquired Texas, they're based in Buenos Aires, Argentina. It's core to us um, because right now more Galileo employees are actually outside of the US than they wow. are in, in the US. Oh, wow. And, and I never would have thought of that pre-acquisition three, four years ago. So, I mean, that just for us, again, just shows, you know, how much we are really focused in some of those uh, emerging markets. So on that note, I want to double click into one thing and then we'll take a uh, back detour back on the path, right? Please. A lot of fintech founders <laughs> that I talk to often are like, hey, I'm considering international expansion. I don't know. And it's always this like ominous gray area of like, should I do it? Should I not do it? When should I do it? Tell us like Galileo's decision to expand to Latin America and your advice for fintech companies on when it's the right time and how to do it as efficiently as possible. 
I'll tell you what the way that we've looked at it and what we recommend to our partners is a couple of things. One of the first things we look at is, you know, what, what problem are you solving by, mm-hmm. by trying to expand? I mean, that's kind of the first thing that we ask. And if they've got a good use case to do that or kind of looking at some different markets, you know, we look at just kind of some very basic questions. I'll give you one example. It's very challenging to expand to the EU. There's a lot of regulation. Oh, okay. They are much further along in kind of payment innovation than we typically are in the U.S., with with all of with you know three secure and G- GDPR and some of those things, but it's a challenge. It's regulated interchange, so you might get 30, 40 basis points at the most. Versus areas, one of the things that was so fascinating about payments, Canada doesn't have credit interchange or debit interchange. They just have interchange. Where you kind of get out and you look at some of these, you're like, oh, maybe it's the U.S. that's a little messed up with all these funky interchange schedules and PIN versus Signature and Durban versus non Durban and you know, all of these different types of things. So I think that that's one of the key things that we look at is, you know, again, what is your real business case there? Can you make it work economically? And then the last thing that I would say um, on kind of international expansion, here's the other key thing to think of just like kind of doing it from the U.S. And you're like, well, we kind of can do this and service other countries. We've made the key decisions. why we've got offices in Mexico City. You have to really be there, right? Boots on the street. No, it's not that you need to have, you know, if you're operating in, like we operate in, in you know, multiple countries in Latin America, we don't have um, offices, but we've got employees in, in I think, uh, 12 or 13 different countries in Latin and South America. So we really have like boots on the street to be able to support it. Because if not, you're just, I think your people just kind of kid themselves. They just kind of are doing it. They're not fully committed to it. And that, and that shows through. And I think that that's kind of one of the other keys. So one of the items, like <clears throat> there are a couple card programs that, that I've worked with that were doing really, really well in the U.S. said, hey, we want to go to Australia. We want to go to New Zealand. We want to go to Latin America. And the funny part is, is that they were initially looking at the revenue model <clears throat> being the same as the U.S. And when we started to do the revenue model in these other regions, they realized they needed a heck of a lot more volume than they thought they did in order to have to really move into that space and and actually generate positive cash flow. Is that something you see happen a lot as well? Yeah, you're spot on. And it's fascinating to look at it kind of across our platform. It's one of the reasons why kind of coming back, like it's really fun to work with all these different types of companies, different constructs, consumer, commercial, debit, credit, US, mm-hmm. Latin America, and look at the variation. Because what you've said there, Ted, is spot on. Look at just like average transaction sizes. Well, in the US, the average transaction size on a consumer debit card, you can almost set your watch by it. It's about $40. <laughs> yeah, I mean, seriously, you can almost set your watch by it. In Latin America, it's about 25. Interchange rates are different. So now you look at this and you're like, oh, okay, so my model in the US is not the same model as it is. Mm-mm. And can I can I get enough cardholders that are going to do enough transaction with a, with enough with a larger, you know, enough average ticket size to generate enough interchange to have these make sense. It's also one of the things, you know, kind of getting back, you know, Loan Pro does an amazing job in the credit space. Here's the other thing that's kind of fascinating a lot of these countries like in Mexico as an example, it's a lot easier to launch a credit product than it is a debit product. It's the exact Opposite, opposite in the of the US. US. The US is typically maybe a little easier to, to launch a debit product. Um, there's not quite as many moving pieces as there are on credit, but it, it's the exact opposite, for, especially from a regulatory perspective in Mexico. So there's those types of things that you look at like country by country, very specific things. And then like you mentioned, PICS in Brazil. I mean, Brazil is it's almost, I know it's in South America, it's almost should be like its own continent because it's got what, you know, 200 million-ish people and they have a yeah. very, very specific payment system. I and mean, every transaction there has to be available for an installment transaction. It's like all of these are just installments. You're just like, you. I can literally buy a pack of gum and turn that into an installment product. And the answer is you can yeah. buy a pack of gum and turn that into an installment product. So I don't know if you should, if you, but, but you can. We could talk about international extension, but like <laughs> what I take away from that, right, is if you're going to do it, don't do it half-assed. Uh, actually get into it, put be- yeah. boots, people on the ground and actually do it. And two, understand the differences in your business model that it doesn't always translate one for one over as you expand. And I think those are two awesome points for any company looking for um, international expansion, especially fintech, because there's so much 
regulatory nuances and yeah. all of those nuances you got to consider. One of the, one of the things that that was may not be blatantly apparent for a lot of the folks that are watching and listening is that this requires you to approach things from a very empathetic customer centric experience and you have to be extremely innovative in that that is something that i see as being super important that has changed really in in the last decade of of it just has to work this way to here's how we need to deliver it i have a unique question for you scott i want to understand the really cool customer centric experiences that are powered by galileo what are some of your customers that are doing just like yeah, extremely personalized stuff on Galileo that you think is just like, man, this is awesome. I think there's a few things that that, that we do that, that are really cool that are like, you know, very specific customized experience. I'll talk about a couple of, of the products that I think are, are really cool. There's some, some really cool specific things that we do in buy now, pay later that we call it, you know, buy now, pay later, post pay. Here's what that means. Let's say if you do 10 transactions in a month and you get your statement or you're looking online at your statement, whatever it is, and you look at, and you see, and you're like, you know what, that transaction number three and number seven, I want to make that actually an installment after the fact. It, it's being able to offer like really, really cool types of, of experiences like that, that are like laser focused, but are fantastic when you look at the ability to be like, okay, I want to be able to enable that type of experience to say, yeah, I can now allow someone to say after the fact, I can make that into an installment. Another one that's interesting um, and again, it's some of the ways we partner with, with Loan Pro, but we, we've got customers who, um, again, I'll kind of go back and look one, what example, maybe they want to do a parenting program and they want to be able to say, again, like my 16 year old, I want him to be able to eat at Chipotle that's three or four blocks away from my house, but not necessarily 30 blocks from my house so that we can, you know, with our technology, make it very specific to where that card can only be used at Chipotle store number one, two, three, seven, not one, two, three, eight, one, mm -hmm. one, two, three, nine, one, two, three, six. Et cetera, and getting laser, laser focused with what we call our account level controls and the use of our auth APIs. Well, you can do it a few different ways from a technology perspective, but using these account controls to be laser specific down to the merchant ID, the merchant name, we can even get so specific, you can even get down to a terminal ID, not that you'd ever necessarily need to do that. But there's things like that that we can do that are like so specific that really enable these uh, kind of great, great use cases across platforms. One of the things, Scott, that we've talked a lot about is increased personalization um, and what that looks like in the ecosystem and the need. I believe modernizing your infrastructure allows you to drive personalization and finance to the level of one. And that's where like your son who wanted to open up a bank account, that's what he expects because that's what he gets from Netflix, Spotify yeah. and Apple and all these brands of like, Here's a recommendation, an actual personalized recommendation that makes sense for me and based on my behavior. And those are the types of things and products that I think Galileo, Loan Pro, other folks are, are going out in the market and trying to drive forward within financial services. Yeah, I, I'll touch on a couple of things. I, I think, Colton, you're spot on as you look at kind of the way we think about personalization. It's just absolutely in our DNA of the way that we've built our system, our, our, our corporate hierarchy structures and, and the way that we think about it. One of the areas that, that why I think we've been so successful is our architecture and hierarchy allows for, again, personalization to the individual level, right? We don't just say, oh, like on the card side, well, every, every person that's part of this bin has to have the exact same, you know, fees, limits, you know, all these types of experiences as just like one big bucket. We can be very, very specific down to like different levels in our system. Like we think about programs, we think about products. And then underneath that, we mm -hmm. go all the way down to individual accounts. And that's honestly one of the reasons why I think we've we've continued to be able to work with so many great fintechs because that's so key to what they want to do is being able to deliver personalized experiences, personalized feature functionality at the individual customer cardholder level. And it goes back a little bit to what we were talking about earlier about modern banking courts. It's one of the reasons why I think that banks are, have struggled, especially over the last three, four, five years in delivering these types of products and services, because it gets back to what we've talked about. They're bolting things on here or there, but they, at the end of the day, they don't have the right infrastructure to really personalize something for Ted versus Colton versus Scott. And I think that that's where it's yeah. hard because the, the core infrastructure doesn't support that, which is again, back to the thesis of 
this is why banks ultimately need to modernize their infrastructure to be able to provide those personalized experiences. And it's native within the architecture, not just like the, the user experience or like a customized, you know, marketing campaign. I mean, those are easy. We're talking about being able to offer this functionality at the core level of the system to then be able to permeate that throughout the entire product offering. What you make me think of as you talk about this, Scott, is years ago, I'm not going to say how many years ago, I worked on a project around healthcare's out of substantiation uh-huh. of being able to use FSA and HSA cards only on the items that qualified. And then I also worked with a couple of the SNAP programs to do a very similar process. Yeah. Look at that. It sounds like what you're talking about is taking that personal, that, that level of detail over to not a can I or can't I, but what can I do with that individual line item? What can I decide to do with that piece of it? And I think that, and Colton, we've talked about this a little bit on the episodes as well. Is like, this is an area that I think that's the next level of personalization that we're really going to be seeing. Yeah, it's interesting, Ted Colton. I, we have some partners that are doing some phenomenal work in this kind of skew level or basket level data. So, you know, again, you've had a lot of experience in that space, you know, specifically on the on the kind of the healthcare HSA side. And uh, there's some really, 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 really cool stuff that's being developed. Now, again, it, it requires kind of the broader payment infrastructure. Like we've got part of the solution on our side, but we're not necessarily acquiring the transaction at Walmart or Target and saying, oh, you can buy bananas, you can buy bread, but you can't do the beer or the cigarettes. Okay, this is going to be not not part of this this type of, of, of healthcare program. But there's some really cool partners we work on, work with right now that have developed some really, really innovative solutions there. I think that one in particular is an area where you're going to continue to see more and more as we kind of think about the future. You're going to see a lot more programs using this kind of laser specific type of technology to be able to get down to that level instead of, again, just like this, this massive, like you can you know, kind of just block an MCC. I mean, that's just like, again, that's really kind of antiquated when you think about it. <laughs> so this is where now you're, you're looking at this to say, yeah, now we get really, really specific down to again, like basket or SKU level. Hey, Ted Huff here. Ever thought about how you could streamline your application and underwriting process? Well, let me introduce you to Under. Why keep using the outdated methods of PDFs when you can digitize them effortlessly? All you gotta do is upload the PDF, send it out for digital signature, and voila, you're set for the digital age. Are you curious on how to make that happen? Head over to under.io forward slash FTC and get started for free. It's really that simple. Shameless plug, but that's one of the reasons why we're stoked about our, our collaboration, what we're doing with Galileo. Loan Pro has developed what we call transaction level credit, the ability to charge interest rates at the transaction level. And you can build really unique credit programs with that. I, I don't know if we brought it up on the podcast, Ted, but we've talked for a while about an active military mm-hmm. duty card, where when a military member goes on deployment for oh, family yeah. back home, you geofence a five mile radius around their house and any gas and groceries oh, are yeah. at a reduced 2% interest rate. For any emotional wellness purchases on the card, uh, they're interest abated for the time of deployment. And think about that level of personalization, the loyalty that that in turn drives and the increased share of wallet, where a lot of institutions right now, or Scott, you brought it up, cost of capital is up, deposits are king. How do I drive greater deposits? You drive greater, greater deposits, in my opinion, by launching personalized products and people being like, man, I'm gonna move more of my financial life over to XYZ institution because they get me, they get who I am and they can help uh, me drive and feed in my life. You talk about that program, Colton, it gives me chills for the simple fact that I remember when I I was in the in service, it was complete opposite. It was like, how can we charge the most interest? How can we take the most advantage of the service members because there were laws put in place that basically said, if you get a loan as a service member, guess what? You can never escape it. Doesn't matter. You can never escape it. <clears throat> and so that was, that made a lot of us really scared to do any sort of loans because we didn't know, like, are we going to get taken advantage? Are we not? And it wasn't just the shady folks that were low sparky style guys. I mean, this was happening for major financial institutions that were 
really leaning heavy into it. So it made us all really scared. That is one of the things that really started to pull me into the financial services industry is like, how, how is this happening? How can this happen? And that's what really pulled me in. Yeah, that's a fascinating story. I didn't know that. And, and, and I love the use case that you're talking about as far as the solutions that Loan Pro brings to the table. I mean, this is one thing that got us excited about our partnership, Colton and, and Ted, is this exact use case. And if you can do flexible interest rates down at the transaction level and just to yeah. let that sink in, all of the various use cases, but certainly in supporting you know, yeah. our, our military personnel, and you think of being able to do that and all the other types of use cases, that's the way that we think about it as well is to say, listen, this is where it gets laser focused. This is what moves the needle on um, being able to do those very, very specific on our per transaction basis. That's again, where I think the future of this is going to be. And I, that's why again, I think one of those pros technology is, is fantastic in this well, area. As so we're talking about all these really cool upcoming new stuff, I wanted to tra transition into the future. Let's but do it. Colton, that's exactly what I was going to say. We're talking about. about the future here. I was just going to say, like, we've been talking about that active military duty card for a while. If, if no one actually launches that card, I'm going to go start my own business, my own credit card company, go launch it. I know that it will work, right? It. And I know there's lots of impact there, but um, let's talk about the future, Ted. Let's jump into it. I want you to uh, hop in Doc Brown's DeLorean, go to the future, come back, and let us know what you see happening in fintech banking lending in the next five to 10 years. You, you got to love back to the future. But I think, you know, as we think about it, you know, I'm amazed we've made it this far into it, the podcast or discussion without actually bringing up AI and machine learning. It seems like that's on everybody's mind right now. As I think about, you know, kind of the future, where is this going? I can't, I can't help but say, how are we going to think about AI and mach machine learning? And I'll give you kind of a couple of examples of areas where we're playing today and where we just think this is going to continue to increase. One of the products that we have is, is a machine learning AI chatbot um, that we've built a, a product called Connecta that's really kind of more of an empathy engine. And we've already seen, you know, a number of banks that use this. And it's, and it's really interesting to see how well this works. So when you test it out, it's like it can really sense when you are getting more frustrated and can kind of drop you right into a customer service queue. It's amazing to see kind of that aspect of AI and machine learning. I think you're going to see more of that. But another area where I think you're going to see just continued focus in this getting better and better is, again, you talked, I think, at the beginning, Ted or Colton mentioned kind of where, we, where we're at in our, in our risk mitigation, our payment risk platform is our product. This is really, as you think about areas of our platform, one of the key areas where our program managers and our customers are saving a lot of money because they've been implementing this over the last you know, year, year and a half, two years. And it just continues to get better and better. The way that this really works is we're able to look at spending patterns, look at modeling, look at behaviors, look at geofencing, some of these areas to really, mm -hmm. really mitigate the fraud that's done on a card portfolio. We typically see, and I think Visa and MasterCard have published some similar numbers, kind of an average card portfolio might have eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 basis points of fraud loss. If you're running you know, MasterCards or Visa's neural net at their level, which card programs do, and then run our payment risk platform underneath it, we're seeing fraud losses down into the three, four, five kind of basis point level. So it's an immediate cost savings. But then the other thing that's got us so excited about the future is also now, think about the cost savings of now someone's not having to call into customer service to actually dispute the charge because that never even happened. And, and now you don't have the cost of the of then submitting the chargeback and going through that and the back and forth of Visa and MasterCard and the merchant on these transactions. And so that's an area where we really think you're just going to continue to see more and more innovation using AI and machine learning kind of across the, the payment and banking landscape. I love that. I kn We knew you were going to bring up AI. It's been brought up in every single episode with differing opinions. It, Ted, what we should probably do is clip together everyone's perspective of AI and we do a clip on like, all unique perspectives of AI. I appreciate and I agree. Like the two biggest things, or the three biggest thing that I hear as I ask, like, what does the future look like? It's AI, obviously. Fraud, still a big problem. How do you decrease fraud? What does that look like? And then the third is increased focus on small business and, and small business banking, small business credit. Mm -hmm. How do you serve the small business customer because some organizations serve them like a consumer, which they are kind of a consumer, but not really a consumer. And some serve them like a commercial client and they're 
kind of a commercial client, but not really. They're this middle ground that we've kind of like left in this gray area. In closing, there is one last question I had actually, because I personally think that sure. one of the most value on this podcast is uh, I hear from my uh, fintech uh, founder and Zach friends on like, hey, I want to understand unique insights that I can take and apply into my business to be successful. As much as you can, Scott, walk us through the transition of the acquisition with DoFi and like what that looks and like insights and learnings from that process. Mm -hmm. Because SoFi is a financial institution, but a very different financial institution. Yeah, it, it's a great question, Colton. And I think it's interesting, again, kind of we touched on the beginning, like I think of like kind of the evolution of my experience at Galileo and really going from like a true startup now to where we had the acquisition in 2020 by SoFi. They're a regulated banking entity. So we're now part of a bank holding company. So one of the things that's been so just fascinating to go through is not only from kind of like, me putting out like, oh my gosh, there's water coming into the data center to now like, how do we stay compliant, you know, across everything that we do? And I actually think it's one of the kind of key learnings that, that we've had as a business is using all of the experience that SoFi as a financial institution now, as a lender, have brought to the table to kind of give us a different perspective. We were fortunate enough to partner with SoFi back in 2018 from the processing side. But now when we got acquired and looking at this, they brought an entire different kind of view for us um, in the marketplace. And I think that that's something that's really key to us now. And it's why, again, we're so focused on financial institutions is because we will always consider ourselves the AWS of fintech, but oh my gosh, it's opened our eyes into all this uh, opportunity within the financial institution space. And that's probably the key kind of learning that, that we have is how much opportunity we have in that, in that side Love of the business. The, the importance of being adaptable. I, we've seen lots of acquisitions go poorly. And we've seen lots of acquisitions go well, right? And one of the key differences I see on my side is the ability of the fintech who's being acquired to be adaptable. But where there's extreme resistance, often it, it doesn't work nearly as well as it does before. So, Scott, thank you for the insights. Really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Colton. I appreciate it. And it's always nice when, when the company that acquires you has an NFL stadium in Los Angeles. So <laughs> that never hurts. Right. Let's, let's be honest here. Right. That never hurts. So that's, uh, that's always yeah. helpful in the process. No, it's been fan fantastic to work with SoFi. But Ted, Colton, thank you very much. I really appreciate your time today. It's, it's been, been a lot of fun. Um, I learned a lot. It's great to always talk about Galileo. You can see I'm very passionate about it. So it's been a lot of fun today. That is another episode of Accrued, a FinTech Confidential series presented to you by Loan Pro. If you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to Fintech Confidential at fintechconfidential.com forward slash access and get notified every time there's a new episode. Also, if you haven't already, download it from your favorite podcast player or watch it on YouTube. As we wrap up today's episode, I've got one last thing for you. If you're in the trenches fighting fraud and financial crime, you know it's a complex battlefield. That's where Hawk's AI tools for real-time payment screening, AML, transaction monitoring, and dynamic customer risk rating come into play. These aren't just buzzwords. They're game changers designed to make your compliance more effective and less of a headache. Imagine slashing through false positives with precision and giving your compliance strategy the edge it needs. Head on over to gethawkai.com to sign up for a demo and discover how their platform can revolutionize how you fight fraud and financial crime. This has been a production of DD3 Media with all rights reserved. This is provided for informational purposes only. It is not offered or intended to be used as legal, tax, investment, financial, or other advice. We strive to provide accurate and up-to-date information, but will not be responsible for any missing facts or inaccurate information. You you comply and understand that you should use any of this information at your own risk. Cryptocurrencies are highly volatile financial assets, so research and make your own financial decisions.